Welcome to Joshua Tree. Located in Southern California, I'm gonna be exploring this park over the next few days. Now, Joshua Tree is known for a few things. Can you guess one? Yes, the namesake, Joshua Tree, which, spoiler alert, it's not even a tree. I'm gonna share some other awesome things about this park, so cue that cinematic music and let's go. I entered the park through its main northwestern entrance in Joshua Tree, and my first stop was for a leisurely walk on the Hidden Valley Nature Trail. This park is massive. It's just under 800,000 acres, making it the size of Rhode Island. And one of the really unique things about it is that it's not just one desert ecosystem, it's two. You have the Mojave Desert that comes down from the north, which meets the Colorado Desert that comes over from the east. And there are more than 700 plant species that live within this park. There are so many little critters that you'll find here from chipmunks to lizards and tons of birds as well. Talk about peculiar. Don't these look like straight out of a Dr. Seuss movie? <laughs> it's like they've got hair <laughs> and spiky little tops. <laughs> Where are the googly eyes? Hello? Are any of you named Josh? Like I was saying before, Joshua trees are not actually trees. They're a succulent, a type of yucca, also in the same family as agave, although I'm not sure what kind of tequila you would get out of this. But one of the really cool features of yucca plants and succulents is that they actually are able to store water inside of their trunks during heavy rain periods. So all of this would be full of water and that's how they're able to withstand these hot summers. But climate change is definitely making it more difficult. Something else I really like is lichen. And if you look closely at some of the rocks, you can actually see little bitty tiny pieces of yellow or green in the cracks or on the surface of the rocks. And this is a type of lichen. I'm gonna be in the park for two nights. My first night, I'm actually gonna be camping. There are actually several campgrounds here in the park. One of the most popular is called Hidden Valley, which is where I was planning on camping, but it's first come, first serve. And you can actually stay there for up to 14 days. <laughs> it's a really popular rock climbing spot in the park, so it's completely full. Luckily, before I came into the park, I booked a backup campsite at Jumbo Rocks. So that's where I'm heading now. It's a really pretty campground. I've been to it before, and it's got some really great giant rocks that we're gonna be able to camp by. The tent is now set up and it's just after six o'clock now. As you can see, the sun's going down pretty early. It is February. I'm just making some dinner and when it gets a little bit darker tonight, before I go to bed, I'm gonna head out to another part of the park called the Choya Cactus Garden. I've heard this is one of the best places to see the stars. So I'm gonna try to get some good astro photos.
so windy. It's just almost six. And all the stakes of the mountain just ripped out of the ground. <laughs> so it looks like I'll be getting up soon. Well, good morning, everybody. It was quite a windy start to the day. I am just doing a short little walk over to Skull Rock, which is located just down the road from the Jumbo Rocks campground. It's right along the road. So if you're not staying at the campground, you can actually park right in front of it, check it out. It's just a short little walk from the campground. So that's what I'm doing this morning. And you're gonna see why it's called Skull Rock in just a second. It's not just cool plant life and cactus that you'll find here in Joshua Tree, but awesome looking rocks. One of the things I wanted to point out are these long lines of a different color that you'll often see in a lot of the rock formations around here. These are actually formed from cooling molten lava. Now, when that happens underground, it actually shrinks. You then get these cracks in the rock. And when more molten lava actually comes in, it fills these cracks and you end up with these really cool formations just like this one. This is Skull Rock and I think you can see why it got its name. Now this park is certainly full of bizarrely shaped rocks and boulders to walk, climb, and crawl through. But there's one other thing that you'll see a large variety of and that's cactus. There are several species of cholla cactus here in the park that you'll run into. This one's got a nickname, the jumping cholla, and it's certainly one you don't want to get too close to when you're on the trail. This is another variety of cholla called the pencil cholla. This area of the park is really fascinating. I love these big giant rock formations. It's like two giants just had a Play-Doh fight and left all of their clay out way too long. It hardened and formed all these brittle mountains, but that's not too far off because we know that these were formed by hardening lava. And then erosion has created these different formations, all the striations and the cracks made incredible places for rock climbing, bouldering, and for geology nerds to just marvel at the rocks. Next stop is the Hall of Horrors. Now this is a rock climbing spot, but there's also a little slot canyon that you can get into, and that's what we're here to see. Okay, I've been searching around for maybe 20 minutes. I think I finally found the Hall of Horrors. It's very narrow. Let's see if we can fit. Well, welcome to the Hall of Horrors. It was very small getting in here, but the way out is even smaller. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to squeeze through there. There is a reason I did not bring my backpack on this short little walk because these narrow openings are very small. It's also really confusing to find this. There are so many paths throughout this area of the desert. So you really have to keep your eyes peeled.
My next stop was the short hike out to Wall Street Mill, which is an easy two mile hike to the site of an old gold mill and homestead. Now on the walk, I passed by several old structures, wells, and remnants from the days of mining and ranching that took place here in the desert over a century ago. It's hard to imagine driving a car like this out here into the desert. So Wall Street Mill was actually an old gold mine. They used a two-stamp system here, and it's from the early 1900s, most of it that we see here from a guy named William Keyes, who actually had a homestead here and a ranch, which I'll be visiting tomorrow. But when he died, this place was actually put into the National Registry of Historic Places, and it's now obviously part of the park. Off to the next adventure, Barker Dam. This is actually just down the road from Wall Street Mill, and it takes us to an old dammed area that was actually put there by cowboys. <laughs> this was a really important ranching spot in the 1800s and early 1900s. A lot of cattle were in this area, and where we're going now is one of the places they used to water the cattle and during rainstorms, it still fills with water. I've heard that there's not really much water in there right now, but we're gonna find out. Behind my right shoulder here is Barker Dam. And I'll tell you what, there is not much water down there we just had days and days of rain in january and uh, this is what's left the last really cool thing on this trail are some petroglyphs there are actually several different native american tribes that lived throughout this area and some of their cave paintings are here There's nothing quite like a sunset in the desert, and one of the best places to see it here in Joshua Tree is at Keys View. This is located on the crest of the little San Bernardino Mountains, and it looks out into the Coachella Valley. But I will say that being up here was extremely windy, and it's also often very smoggy in this area which is just a reminder of how dry, dusty, and close you are to the major metropolises of Southern California. If you're coming here to the park, you might have some questions in your planning process, so I'll try to cover as many of those as I can. Now, the best times to visit Joshua Tree are going to be from October to around March. You can come in those other months, but keep in mind it's going to be extremely hot, like in the 90s at night and during the day or higher. So keep that in mind when planning a trip out here. It is the desert. It is, you know, higher altitude than some of the other places in Southern California, but still gets extremely hot and that can make coming to this park extremely dangerous in those warmer months as well. Now, there is also no reception in pretty much the entire park. So if you're coming here, you'll want to download offline maps, whether that be on Google Maps, on all trails or on Onyx Off-Road if you're doing any OHV trails here in the park and have those obviously before you come into the park. Also, if you have a camping reservation or something like that, you wanna take a picture of that or save it to your phone. So um, if in case there's an issue, you have that already on your phone. Bring everything that you need. There are no services here in the park outside of the Southern Cottonwood Visitor Center, which is not in the area most people are going to come explore here in the park. So you'll need all the water and food that you are going to require on your trip. And as I said about the temperatures here, it is hot. Even in February right now, it's probably in the high 70s right now. 
you need water, you need sun protection, you need layers. Try to avoid being outside in the heat of the day from noon to 3 p.m. if you can, especially if you're in one of those hotter months. And know also that the temperatures change here drastically, especially in this cooler season. The mornings and evenings can be rather cold. So bring a jacket if you can for that as well. If you're wondering where to stay, there are actually several options. Most people are gonna stay in the towns of Joshua Tree, Yucca Valley, or 29 Palms if they're gonna be exploring the northern section of this park, which is the most popular. You could also stay in Indio or Palm Springs. Just know that it is gonna be a bit longer of a drive to come into the park, and you're probably less likely to do multiple days here in the park if you're staying in that southern section closer to Interstate 10. But there are a variety of options from camping in the park, you can stay in an Airstream at Auto Camp in Joshua Tree, you can rent an Airbnb. There are hotels like Fairfield Inn and Marriott up here as well. Uh, as far as food options, I would say it's rather limited. These are not big metropolitan areas. There's not a lot of options for dinners. You're gonna be much better off like shopping at the grocery store, making what you want as far as things to bring into the park. However, there are some great cafes for breakfast and lunch as well. My last little tidbit here is to always, always, always leave no trace. Always be respectful of this land and the wildlife here. And uh, now let's get back to more fun stuff. The history of Joshua Tree National Park goes back to 1936 when this became a national monument. But it wasn't until 1994 that it became a national park. In the century prior to that, you had cattle ranchers out here, you had cowboys, and you had people mining for gold. And there were quite a few homesteaders that lived out here as well. Now, one of the famous homesteaders that you might hear about here in the park is William Keyes. His homestead is still part of this park. It's now available for guided tours with rangers. And I'm gonna be heading there just in a few minutes to check out the ranch and learn about the history. It's gonna be a really cool experience. This is actually the first ranger-led tour I've ever done at a national park. And I'm really excited about it. Now, the mining history here runs deep. You'll see that a lot of the trails here in the park actually take you to some of the old mining areas. You'll see a lot of old vehicles on some of the trails, some remnants of mining machines as well, but there's definitely a rich history of that here in the park. And I just wanna mention as well, before there were white settlers in this area of the country, there were numerous Native American tribes some of which still call this place home. So I definitely want to honor them by making this video as well and just keeping this beautiful land protected. This is the Keys Ranch. This site was protected as it is a great depiction of what life would have been like back then. I just can't imagine living way out here, really in the middle of nowhere in such a stark and somewhat brutal environment. But the Keyes family thrived here, and they had many different businesses. As mining started to decline and the rumblings of this place becoming a protected area started, William Keyes and his family had many methods of making money, from canning their own fruits that they grew in their orchard, to having guest cabins, and even renting out some of their old equipment to other miners. Now this guided tour was such a great way to learn about the history of not only the park, but a lot of the unique plants and wildlife, and also a lot of the Native Americans that used to inhabit this area of the world as well. Most visitors coming here to Joshua Tree are gonna enter through the Joshua Tree exit, which is on the east. But if you're coming up from Pump Springs or Indio or I-10 in the south, you're gonna come up through the Cottonwood area where the Cottonwood Visitor Center is. And there's a couple of things in this area of the park you won't wanna miss as well. There are some great OHV trails in this part of the park, like Pinkham Canyon, which will take you to some really remote areas of the desert. And you also won't want to miss a hike out to Cottonwood Springs or Mastodon Peak. Well, this brings this National Park adventure to a close. Thank you so much for joining me here in Joshua Tree. What a fun few days here in the desert. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you want to come visit this National Park now. And if you've got questions or comments, make sure you drop them down below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And if you are new here, please hit that subscribe button. I've got so many adventures, not just from national parks, but epic, unique destinations all around the world. And if you wanna learn more, 
check out the video library here on YouTube. You can also check out my blog, alicesadventuresonearth.com. And until the next adventure, stay safe out there. If you're coming to this national park, make sure you're prepared. I will see you all soon. As always, I'm Alice Ford. Never stop exploring.